Hey, how's everyone doing today? It's uh, James Daner, Heat Daner Real Estate. Um, hey, we are going to hang tight for just a few more minutes before we get going. Um, so I might just run about five minutes over just to see if people want to log in. Um, we have a few more people trying to get on right now. So uh, if you can hang tight for five minutes, then we will uh, we'll get this thing going. Thanks. Hey, for everyone that joined in, we're just waiting a couple more minutes. Uh, we're waiting for a couple more people to kind of log on, and then uh, we will get going in about two minutes. We'll get this going. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you, for everyone, for kind of hanging in there as people are starting to log on. Uh, uh, first, let me say uh, thanks for everyone for coming out, uh, listening. So uh, just a quick premise of why we're doing this is, you know, we've had a lot of clients and a lot of investors around the community. Uh, they come and talk to me about construction tips, and um, they're always looking for extra advice. So what we figured we'd do is put together a training series, um, which is going to be a four-part series on construction, and then we're going to do another four-part series on the next topic after that. Uh, where these webinars will be running every two weeks for just kind of basic investor 101 training. Um, these are all free. It's for everybody. You can feel free to share it everywhere. It's just a way for Heat Painter to kind of get back to the investment community. Um, so this uh, presentation is um, gonna it's gonna last about 30 minutes, um, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna follow up with 30 minutes of questions. So if you just hang around, uh, what you do, and uh, and this is our first webinar, so I'm still getting familiar with it. Uh, you put in the questions, and then we'll we'll answer the questions in a, in the order they're kind of collected, um, and then we'll kind of go from there. So uh, to get this kind of started off, who am I and why are you listening to me? So uh, I've been a full-time investor since 2006 uh, when I was a senior in college at University of Washington. Um, since 2006, I've flipped over 500 homes with my business partner. Um, 
And what we've done since flipping all these homes, we've created a brokerage that specializes in helping investors acquire discounted property, whether it's on market, off market. And uh, what we kind of what we're known for is helping investors design their product to help them get it sold quickly on the market. Um, we have done over 1,300 listings in transactions with our investors, just like uh, the ones we're going to talk about. Uh, so we have a little bit of experience, and out of that experience, we've lost a lot of money, and that's what uh, we've made a lot of money, but we also have lost money. I mean, I personally have lost over five hundred thousand dollars to contractors in the last ten years, and our goal is is to teach you guys my five hundred thousand dollar lessons for free over the next uh, eight weeks. So, um, what we're going to talk about today is uh, we're going to start with prepping for your walkthrough. Uh, what I do, uh, you know, when a, when an opportunity or deal is sent my way, what I do to get ready for it to make sure I'm making the right decision. Um, and then what I look for when I'm doing my initial walkthroughs on these investment properties and then how I kind of evaluate them and start to put together my budget um, and get prepped for hiring my contractor. And then again, uh, like we had talked about, we're gonna do a question and answer for 30 minutes afterwards. You can feel free to ask as specific questions as you want. I will try to answer them um, to, to the best of my ability without pictures. And, um, you know, or for any heat and dinner client, just feel free to email me pictures too, and, or at any time, just call your broker and we'll come walk out and kind of look at the problem for you. Um, so to get started, we're going to jump right in and we're going to talk about my first initial walkthrough and what I do on these properties and what we suggest that people do, um, when they're looking at investment properties. So when a deal is sent my way, the first thing I want to know is, is it on sewer or septic? Um, and if it is on septic or sewer, has it been inspected? Because no matter how many walkthroughs I do, I can't see in the ground. And those are those can be ten to thirty thousand dollar items that I want to have verified, no matter what. Um, and depending on the price of the property, the septic blowing up could just kill the deal immediately, and I could just kind of move on. Uh, because you know, besides prepping for my initial budget, I'm also prepping my time. And as an investor, you want to focus on the deals that are good. Um, the other thing that I always ask is, is there any open permits? Um, I do get a lot of properties sent to me that are kind of half demoed. Um, so if I want to know what's my construction timelines and how I'm going to prepare for my budget based on whether I know it needs to be a full permit, if it's going to be a plan review permit, or do I need to rework a bunch of things to get the city happy and off that project's back. So those are things that I always am going to check first for. Um, what do I bring with me? I always bring a tape measure because I'm trying to figure out rough floor plans as I'm walking through, um, a flashlight because I want to see in sp specific areas like crawl spaces and attics and just, you know, actually a lot of the homes I go to don't have power and maybe have a little bit of garbage. So I like to be able to see what's going on there. Um, always something to write on, a notepad or a walkthrough sheet, because, you know, taking notes is very, very key. You know, I, I it's, it's very easy to forget where certain things are or what you saw there. So, the notepad works really well for me as I'm sketching out my floor plans and or what's going on in the house as I'm doing my quick walkthrough. And then always a camera uh, or, or your, you know, when everyone brings their smartphones. But and take lots of photos because in this walkthrough, a lot of times when I get a property, I have one chance to walk through this property. I want to take as much notes and document as many pictures as possible so I can really crunch my numbers to make sure I'm making a smart decision before I move to purchase. Um, and the other thing that I always bring too, which, you know, I think a lot of investors don't bring is that you even, even if you're prepping for a construction budget, you need to bring your comparable property data. It's fundamentally important for any investor to have, because you need to know what kind of finishes need to go in the house as you're looking at the investment and then what kind of layout you need to achieve to get the value. If I'm going out to look at a two bedroom, one bath house and I need to turn it into a four bedroom, three bath house. I need to know what my comparables are and what I'm doing to create the right budget number for it. And as I'm doing my walkthrough, I need to make sure that that bedroom and bathroom count is actually achievable. And if it's not, I need to re kind of calculate my investment. And then I personally think you should always bring your real estate advisor or your broker that's helping you with the deal because they should be able to give you advice on floor plans, specs, what the comparable data is, what, how over the top you should go on the property or not over the top. Um, you know, at Heat and Dana, and I know we train all our brokers, uh, so they're specialized in helping design layouts, floor plans, and picking specs. 
Um, the reason they're trained so well that way is because we want to, our clients to be very educated through every step of the process or if they have questions about budgeting that outside their contractor, they can actually ask their broker to kind of play a mediator for them. Um, but before I go to uh, the properties, these are definitely things that I always make sure I'm checking out. Um, the other thing that in, uh, we're going to provide you guys with this is the heat and danger, uh, it's a walkthrough checklist. This is the same checklist I use as I'm walking through a property or any of my brokers or they walk through also fill out this um, property checklist. And what it does is it kind of gives it in a very organized fashion to where as you're walking through a property, you don't forget to check on things. You know, it goes from demo to paint to roof to siding. So as I'm walking through my property, I can just kind of check these things off. So um, after I'm all prepared, when I get to the house, these are the things that I'm going to be looking for. So over the next couple of slides, what we're going to talk about is just specific areas that can cost quite a bit of money and why I'm checking for them. So the first one's foundation walls. Um, the reason I check foundation walls is because I had bought in a, a home at the auction before and we did a drive by and I didn't get out to check on it. And uh, I personally bought a house that had no foundation. It looked like it had a concrete foundation. Uh, the driver notes didn't have it, but uh, the driver notes said concrete, but it turned out to be uh, all siding. So first thing I look at is, is my foundation stable? Is it set? Is it uh, post and pure? If it's post and pure, I don't want the deal or I need to factor 30 grand in the foundation. If it's a slab on grade, is it uh, is the drainage correctly? Is there any settling going on? Or if it's just a, uh, a, a post and beam with the cinder block foundation around, is that cinder block in really good shape? Is it secured correctly? And then I want to check all the footings underneath the house. The reason those footings are so important is because those can cost um, underneath your home a thousand dollars per footing, and so every post and concrete footing you have to pour that's a thousand dollars. So if there's ten of them, that's ten grand, which will uh, hyper accelerate your budget and make you go over it quite a bit. The roof, roof's pretty easy to see when you get out there. Um, you know, typically, you know, one thing I like to tell people is though even if the roof is looking newer, but it may be a little wavy check on the side ridges because many times previous homeowners will just lay roofs over uh, over themselves you can only have up to two layers on a roof and honestly that doesn't pass a lot of inspections regardless but you can do it up to two layers and after the second layer you need to tear them all off if there's more than one layer on the roof that doubles your demo cost to your your roof every time so if you're two layers, you're going to have double the demo cost or three layers, double the demo cost because of all the weight. So those are things to check for because a standard roof that may cost five to 6,000 can turn into 10,000 really quickly if you're not looking for those things. Um, other things, gutters, are, are they attached? Um, if they're not attached, I'm actually really kind of looking around the corners of the property because if a gutter has not been attached to a home for longer than, you know, even a six month period, what happens is the water starts pooling at all the corners of the homes and it can cause settlement and sinking, which can cost you anywhere between five and $10,000 to install new drainage, level the floors, um, and uh, kind of level the whole house out. So gutters are a big deal. I always, you know, it's a, it's a simple, cheap item that a lot of people just blow through, but what it does is it gives me an indicator of other possible issues as I start walking the house. And going into gutters, drainage issues, right? So if I see gutters that have been not been present for over six months or a year, and you know, I go in the house it's a little bit crooked, I have to factor into my budget to install new drainage around this house because new drainage is what's going to stop the sinking or prevent the sinking from further issues. As a seller, you know, if your home is has slipped over drainage times, it's that's okay. And it need, but it needs to be remediated with drainage. So it, it handles all the objections from any new potential buyer. If you can show a warranty drain system in the property. These drain systems on the exterior can cost anywhere between, for French drains from two to 4,000. On the inside, uh, how we do them is we trench in into your drains, um, just like kind of the picture that you see right there, but on the inside wall of foundation. And that costs about three to $5,000 depending on the basement. So again, it's a big budget item, and so those are things I'm checking for. Um, deck repairs. Decks, lumber is at an all-time high right now, so decks can be kind of expensive. So I always check to make sure I go around, and not only am I looking at the top boards, most importantly, I'm looking underneath the deck because that's the most expensive part. What is supporting the deck? 
is it pressure treated? Does it have proper uh, footings and pier pads? And is it properly installed the ledger boards to the house? If they're not, again, this can be a two to four thousand dollar item very, very quickly. So even though a deck could have brand new deck boards on top or rotted deck boards, that doesn't mean that the deck is good or bad. So you got to further investigate and check all underneath every different section. And then don't underestimate landscaping. I always dig into my landscaping. I'm looking at my comparables. Landscaping is a, bu a budget item that can creep up on a lot of different uh, houses. The reason being, it all comes down to the size of the lot. So as you get prepped for walking these properties, you know, make sure that you have all the square footage of the yard. How overgrown is it? Is uh, is it sticker bushes? Are you gonna have to grade it down? And then also check to see how level is the yard. Uh, sometimes yards cannot look that bad, and they may have six inches of grass. But as you walk through them, you feel all these dips and valleys. So as you go to put in your mature landscaping, it gets very bumpy. It's not very sellable and it's not very desirable for most uh, owners. So again, as you're walking, make sure that you're not end underestimating your landscaping budget. Siding. Um, there's a few, siding can, <laughs> siding can creep up on you in many different ways. Um, you know, things that we're looking for, um, depending on the neighborhood we're in. Uh, you know, if we're in Seattle, first thing I look for is what kind of siding is it? Is it Asphalt siding, which can many times have asbestos in it, which is going to cost you anywhere between ten and fifteen thousand to remediate, plus residing the house. Or if it's a house built out in Federal Way in the early '90s, there's a lot of Louisiana Pacific LP siding that has been recalled that needs to be pulled off the house. These are big budget items, so things that you want to look for is it on the asbestos, is it LP, and then or is it a press board or just regular siding that can be repaired. So it's really important to look through every, you know, hit all sides of your house, figure out what materials are on there, whether they're in good shape or they're rotting or not. Uh, like the specific picture that we have up right now, that's just cheap press board T111 siding. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that siding, but if it's not prepped and painted over time, the weather starts beating it up and it causes um, panels to come off. So the good thing about that siding, though, is you can actually replace just a section for a fraction of the cost. So at the same time, you can actually prepare your siding for a lot cheaper based on whatever the materials are. Um, the other things I look for on the exterior, just any kind of sign to rot, right? Any kind of water damage, check all your window casings. You can check all your corner boards, underneath your fascia boards. And that's going to tell you whether the homeowner's been neglecting and preventing water damage or they've actually been staying on top of their basements. If you see numerous signs of rot on the outside of the house, that's okay. That probably is reflective in the price. but you need to make sure to investigate for further rot because if it's in the most transparent place in the front of your house on the fascia boards where they're letting it rot, then the areas that are harder to find are most likely rotting too. Um, and then like we talked about in the foundation section, your crawl space can be a very big ticket item. To redo a whole crawl space with new insulation, new vapor barrier, and a full clean out can run anywhere between three and $5,000 depending on how bad it is. Uh, you know, sometimes if it's just a vapor barrier, you're looking at $1,200 item. But because there's so much variance in a crawl space, you always want to check. You know, if your budget is $50,000 for a house and you forget to check your crawl space and that's $5,000, additionally, that's 10% of your whole budget that just went into an area where the, the next buyer really isn't going to appreciate it. So when you go through these homes, always take a peek. You know, I don't like to go in crawl spaces. I've actually only been in three my whole life because I just don't like spiders. But the good thing about cell phones, you put it in there, you got your you got your camera on with a flashlight, and get everything you need to see. What you need to see though is check for your drain lines, which is gonna tell you what kind of plumbing's in the house. If there's insulation under, which is gonna tell you how much it's gonna cost to insulate the, uh, the crawl, your vapor barrier, if there's standing water, which could require a sump pump, which is another two to $3,000 item with wiring in there, and then also checking your pier pads like we talked about, which those pier pads uh, and posts right there in the picture, those, if they're done correctly, will cost $1,000 each. In that picture is something I see quite often from homeowners where instead of paying $1,000, they go get a $50 jack and they just put it right on the ground or against a piece of board and to prevent sagging. That works for them, but that won't work for the next buyer. 
So check all those items because your crawl space can end up costing you five to ten thousand dollars very, very quickly. Electrical. I am a big I check everything electrical in houses. And the reason is being is because it's a safety hazard. And it's also a big ticket item. To rewire a house, um, you know, typically what we pay electricians, which I think is pretty market, is we pay them three dollars a square foot to rough in wire. So for all Romex ran. We pay $1,200 for a new panel, uh, excuse me, $1,500 for a new panel, $1,200 for a new meter. So on a 3,000 square foot house, that's a $10,000 bill without any extras right there. Um, things that I look for in a house, because, you know, in Seattle, we have this mixture of homes anywhere, you know, especially homes in the 1950s where some have uh, knob and tube, some have cloth wrap on grounded wiring and some have Romex wiring. So it makes a big difference in what your budget is and what your offer amount may be, depending on what's there. So the items that are good indicators for you guys to check when you're looking is A, are all the prongs grounded? Are all the outlets grounded? Okay, not just some everywhere. If you just see sporadic grounded plugs, that means most likely the rest of the switches are not grounded. Um, the other thing I look at is I find the panel, that's the first place I go, what kind of panel is it? You know, so right here in the specific picture, what this is, is a Zinsco 100 amp panel with no shut off. Okay. Zinsco and Federal Pacific are bad. You don't want those in your home for reselling. Not because they're at, they're not working correctly. It's because they have a history of fire hazard and every home inspector will always reference that in the report. As a broker, what I've learned is dealing, you know, you can negotiate through most inspection items, but safety items when people are buying remodel houses, is a big deal to most buyers and you might lose that potential buyer. So always check your electrical and always make sure you are budgeting for the right, correct repairs. And also always permit your electrical. I'm a firm believer in that. Um, last thing you want is some tradesmen to burn your house down uh, after the fact or someone else's house. Um, and then on the other picture right there, uh, we have the AMPA service. So, uh, and this can kind of sneak up on people too. Sometimes previous owners will replace the panel with a new 200 amp panel, but they don't do the service because they only have a hundred, they only need a requirement for a hundred amps inside the house. Okay. So what this means is you're still going to have to upgrade your mask and your meter, which is going to be a $2,500 item. So you want to look at what your meter box is, the size and the install date. And also you can tell by the conduit wiring coming in from the top mask. If you see it's a thicker gauge with a bigger mass, most likely it's a 200 amp panel. And then also you should be able to check the meter um, to kind of verify what kind of ampage is running to the house. Another big ticket item is plumbing. Homeowners love to jerry-rig your plumbing. So uh, if you see in this, this picture right above, you know, you have a mixture of plumbing going on. Um, the blue stuff is PEX. PEX is good. PEX is new. That means uh, that's what we install in every new house. That old gray stuff is galvanized plumbing. That's not good. Um, what what happens with galvanized plumbing or what mo most home inspectors are going to say when a buyer's coming to buy your investment is that it, it corrodes, it rusts, and it stops working eventually. And also it's going to affect their water pressure. So what it does is it puts a notion in the next buyer's uh, mind that they're going to have to replace all the plumbing in the house. So what you want to stay away from or what I'm looking for when I'm doing the walkthrough is, you know, some of the plumbing may work or, you know, I'll walk into a house and the homeowner will say, oh, I updated all my kitchens and bathrooms, you know, uh, in the 90s. But then you go in and you see that, well, they only tied in new plumbing into old galvanized. So at the end of the day, the problem is still there and I still need to factor for a full replumb, depending on the size of the project. Another little t uh, hint that I see quite a bit uh, that I use is, on plumbing, if I can't see any of the plumbing or none of it's exposed in the crawl space or in the basement, a lot of times in the bathroom, if you have a three-pronged valve, just like you're seeing there, it's those are, that's indicators that it has galvanized plumbing. Now, about 20% of the time, there is copper plumbed in those, and those are going to be homes that are built in the 1960s or newer. But if you see those three prong, those three valves, and it's older than 1950, I would assume that you need to replumb most of the house. Um, and then your HVAC and ducting layout. These are other big ticket items. So your standard furnace, you know, for electric furnace, it costs you $1,800 to $1,900 installed. 
your gas furnace should be $2,200 and your oil furnace is going to run you about $3,200. Uh, but the thing that you don't want to underestimate is if you have an old furnace like we're seeing in the picture, um, that the ducts are usually half the size of what they should be for new code or they might be ran around in different areas. Um, the other reason I talked about bringing your comparable data to the walkthrough is that you want to know what desired layout you have, which is going to affect your ducting layout too. So if I'm, again, taking a two-bedroom, one-bath house and turning it into a four-bedroom, three-bath house, chances are I need a budget for reducting the whole house because the house may only have ducts that would heat two spaces. So again, make sure you check into those and check your layouts to adjust your budgets accordingly for your ducting. Many times the ducting will cost actually three to four times the amount of your actual furnace cost. And then the other thing that I'm looking for is, is it plaster or drywall? Plaster, uh, well, if it's plaster, we, we have to factor for resheet rock in most of the house, depending on what we're trying to accomplish there. Um, what it also does, though, is if you're plastering your home and you decide to remove it, the demo costs go up by about three times the amount. So not only do you have to drywall the whole house, the weight of the plaster will, will cause a lot of weight, and it's going to cause a lot of dumping fees. And so what you want to do is make sure you know, for a standard, let's say a standard 2,000 um, square foot house that has drywall that you're demoing, you know, that could cost you three to four grand to take the drywall out. If it's plaster, it's going to cost you eight to nine thousand. So just make sure you take note of that. Are you removing it all? And if you are, make sure you accommodate for that in your your in your demo budget. And then uh, settlement in the home. This is another big kind of item that I'm always looking for. A lot of the homes that we buy or that Seattle produces are homes that are built before 1950. Okay, these homes have been there for a long time. They've had a lot of different fill underneath them. They've had drainage issues. They've made it have missing gutters. And over time, the houses begin to sink. So if I go into a home and it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit settled. It's not too concerning to me because, you know, you can level it out with Jip Creek and self-leveler. But what I am looking for is what's the indicator of why it happened. Most of the times it's caused by drainage. But, you know, again, if I see settlement in the home, the first thing I'm doing is checking the foundation. I'm checking all the drainage and seeing if there's an actual issue going on or is it just slowly sink, like settling over time. If it's slowly settling over time, you're looking at, you know, a two to three thousand dollar floating floor repair bill. If it's a broken foundation, it's twenty to thirty grand. So make sure you take note of that settlement and make sure you kind of figure out what the cause and condition is. Um, a thing that can cause settlement in the home, though, is moisture in the basement. If you get too much moisture piling up in your basement for lack of drainage or lack of gutters, this is why the home will sink. Good news is you can fix it with way you budget it with trenching in some new drainage and then leveling the floor. But make sure you're taking a look at this. Again, moisture in the basement. If you plan on finishing your basement, it can cost you a good three to five thousand just before you can start putting it back together. So you want to make sure you accommodate for that. Ceiling height. Make sure you note your ceiling height in the house. Reason being is because it can substantially affect your drain cost uh, or your framing cost. Um, so make sure you know where you want to put your bedrooms and everywhere else. Hot water tanks, usually they're, they're stamped with dates on there in a, a warranty. So check your dates. Hot water tanks last eight to 10 years for most inspections. They really will last 14 years, but they're going to call you after 10. And then again, like we talked about, signs of asbestos. Does it have asphalt siding? Does it have popcorn ceilings? If it does, I, you know, I usually increase my button, my demo cost by five to ten thousand dollars just to have that property abated. And again, like we talked about settling, just checking your foundation slabs. Does it have any cracks or tears or breaks? Um, go up and check your attics. Make sure that it, they're cleaned out, that there's insulation. Um, also, that's going to tell you where all your wiring is a lot of times. Is it knob and tube? Is it Romax? Is it cloth wrapped? And again, decks. Decks are important. We put it in twice. It can be expensive. And then other things that I look for are just unpermitted additions. And the reason I do that is because A, it can makes the home schematic look a little weird. It's harder to sell. I want to see if it's actually conforming. And then if there was no permit pulled, I mean, good examples in the city of Kirkland, there's a addition that we, a home we bought with an addition that had been there for 40 years. The guy built it with his own hands. He did it through the city of Kirkland. They had lost all plans, didn't have any permits. The whole remodel in the house cost just $41,000. 
to fix the addition to the way City of Kirkland wanted us cost us 31000 So it can be a big, big ticket item and it can really screw up your project. And then again, on foundation, just the skirting, um, making sure you don't, make sure you actually have a foundation there, not just siding. And then uh, where all your, be your beam placement needs to go for your layouts. Um, so other items to note that I always take a look at is, you know, as I'm adjusting for my framing and plumbing and electrical budgets, where do I want my living spaces, right? As you're doing the walkthrough, note that. Work with your broker. Figure out what you think is the optimal resale plan and then what's the optimal budget resale plan. City location. What is the timelines that you're going to need to do if you need to pull permits? Is it two days or is it 20 days? And then surrounding neighbors. or two, Sorry, is it two days or it can be up to nine months, guys? Uh, and then what is your surrounding neighbors and location? Reason you want to note this for your budget or is your uh, note for your budget is because if you have to install fencing, that can be twenty dollars per linear foot. That can turn into a t six to ten thousand dollar job really quickly at your your project, which just reduces your profit. If you got bad neighbors, make sure you account for screening and privacy. So. So now that we got through all the pictures and you guys, we went a little long. This is my first practice of this so we're going to keep going but we're going to talk about budgeting your project um, so the you on our next class what we're going to do is talk about putting our budget or our next webinar we're going to talk about putting the budget together and negotiating the contractor but before I do that what I do is I establish all my pricing so after I've walked the property I've gotten seen what I need to do saw all the items I need to fix then I need to establish my pricing and what I need to do what if I walk through a house and I say my budget is a hundred thousand how did I get to that number and why am I at that number? How I get to those numbers is I create a spec allowance, right? What do I need to put in the property and what is the actual cost? I personally do not let contractors tell me what the cost is. I tell them what the cost is. That helps me keep my projects under control. Um, establishing install pricing. Before I bring trades out there, I'm going, hey, for this area, I know flooring guys will install floors at $1.50 a square foot. So that's my established pricing for the flooring. Or for painters, I pay painters $2 a square foot on the inside. So it's very important to establish your budget pricing before you actually come up with a number. You can't logically come up with a number if you don't decide that number. Um, if you need help putting together your budget, we can help do that. We have a bidding uh, program that we do for all our clients that kind of breaks down install versus uh, material cost um, that works really well. Um, that example also will be in this package that we're going to give you guys. You guys are going to get a copy of our walkthrough, all our uh, budget sheets, and I think a construction contract as well. Um, and then also have a detailed spec for the contractor. So you're prepping this to negotiate a contract right now. Make sure you have all these things put together. Know, know what spec you want to put in the house, and in that way it's going to prevent change orders and keep you in budget. And then before, as you as you start putting together your budget again, make sure you get your you know your measurements to collect because that you know size of houses and size of lots should really establish what the budget should be. You know, I don't. A lot of people bring me deals and they tell me the house studs out and it's two thousand square feet and needs a hundred grand, and then they tell me it studs out and it's three thousand square feet and needs a hundred grand. That logically makes no sense, right? If a house is bigger, it should cost more. So know what the total lot size is for your landscaping budget. For me, on a quick rule of thumb, I allocate 50 cents a square foot for landscaping. That usually gets it done for me. Um, also note your above ground square footage versus your gross square footage. Because if your above ground square footage is 20 minutes, or sorry, 20% smaller than your gross, you need to accommodate for that in your exterior items. Like your siding should be at your above ground square footage. Your exterior paint should be at your above ground square footage. So you don't want to run all your gross square footages at your tr other trades square footages. Um, and then make sure to note your pitch of your roof, right? If I have a really steep uh, pitch of roof, like I pay $240 a square to replace a roof. If it's on a higher pitch, I'm going to adjust it up by 20% to accommodate for the, the, the pitch. Uh, note your driveways and concrete surfaces. Broken concrete in driveways can be very expensive to demo and reinstall. So if you have a busted driveway, you want to make sure you accommodate for that. Pouring new um, new concrete driveway can cost you anywhere between two and five thousand bucks, or asphalt you can get it down for two to three thousand typically. So um, retaining walls are any retaining walls 
kind of coming over a little bit or they kind of sagging if they are that can most of the time you're going to have to end up tearing them out not just strapping them up um and then check drainage obviously that's a big deal because i've mentioned brought it up now four times you know check your drainage check your water it they, they kill houses and then also note in the contract or the offer is there remaining trash to um to remain that's happened to me numerous times where i thought i was buying a house that was trash free but it turned out the trash was included and it cost me three to four thousand dollars in my profit right away now that we kind of talked about uh measurement select it, we're going to talk about what you do before you call that contractor to come out um and, and meet with you so things that i always have prior to meeting my contractor on site and you guys one thing we'll talk about in the next webinar is I actually don't bring a contractor out to my site until I have a plan. I don't want him doing my initial walkthrough because I don't have 100% confidence in it yet until I put together my budget and my floor plan. I'm a firm believer that if you have 100% confidence, you can control your budget better. If you're asking contractors for the plan and the design, they're going to just crush you on your budget. So, so before I hire my contractor, I set a budget in a bidding format. That's telling me what my budget should be, not just a rough estimate. I need to know what my desired floor plan is because I need to dictate to that contractor how much the framing is going to be at that time. And then I make sure I have a construction contract. Very important, guys. There's a lot of bad people in this market right now. There's countless amounts of people getting ripped off from contractors, including myself. Have a contractual agreement. If you only have an estimate from them or a bid, that's not going to hold up as well as a con contract that details the timelines and the processes they're supposed to follow. And then always verify your contractor. Uh, we put the link in there at L and I to make sure that they're licensed and bonded. You know, not just their license, also check their bond. Because if something happens, you want to be able to go after that bond. Or if you go to sell it, you, you know, selling a home when you hire non licensed and bonded contractors can be very difficult. So you want to make your property as marketable as possible. Um, and then what we threw in here for you guys at the very end is uh, just some, some helpful uh, rules and regulations for you guys. Uh, these are good things to check out before you start a project. Uh, it, this is a link to the asbestos website. So this tells you everything you need to know about what you need to do as far as getting a survey and what the guidelines are for the specific area of remodeling home home. Um, permits. You know, checking your permits, what what you need to permit and not permit in the area you're looking at a house that can make a big difference on your holding times and your cost of subs. Um, also, be familiar, if you want to be an investor flipping homes, get familiar with all the laws, right? General contractor flipping laws is here for you to where you guys can kind of read up um, and, and what you need to be as far as your own license. Um, so what we're going to do now is, um, you know, we're going to start taking questions from everybody. Um, and then, you know, one thing I just want to tell you is you guys, our next webinar is going to be uh, in two weeks. And the next series on that is actually me, my tips for negotiating contractors. So this is one you want to be at. Um, this is all my secret little tricks and little things, shenanigans I pull on them to make sure I, I'm staying in budget. So, um, so what you guys want to do is you want to go onto your, uh, the webinar box and that you'll see a questions box. If you have any questions about construction or just anything in general, go ahead and put it in the box and just send it in and then we'll start answering the questions. And another thing is uh, there's, uh, if you look at the, you'll say uh, on the handouts button, if you click that, that's going to have all these resources for you, which will be the resources to all the website, the walkthrough checklist. Uh, what else we got? So we got uh, those items. Anybody have any questions? I get questions all day long from people about construction, and no one has a question right now. So Peter asked if we have a walkthrough spreadsheet to share. Um, yes, we do. If you uh, click the downloads um, section, yeah, that will download um, the, the walkthrough for you. Or if you call Heat and Dana Broker to show you the property, we bring them with us. 
Um, Jack asked, uh, yes, we do have a copy of our construction contract. Unfortunately, that is only for heat and dinner clients. We had it kind of created for ourselves and our clients. If you do become a client, then we will provide you with that contract. Oh, Robin asked a really good question. Uh, at what point do you hire a con or fire a contractor? This is uh, – that is a very, very good question. Uh, it kind of depends more on the situation. So I personally have had to fire numerous contractors over my life. Um, so I think the, the best answer for that is, A, how, how much have you paid him? first is you know like i always look at when i'm having an issue with a contractor and this is important I and mean, we're going to talk about this in um the budgeting section next time about how i reduce the situations of firing people because if you set up the budget right and you plug in your subs correctly you can act, what i've learned is i've had to fire less people um but uh what i do is i always go okay you know, a lot of times you give this contractor 20 grand and you're hoping they, they get five grand worth of stuff done. And then they have your 15,000. You're trying to get them to do stuff and they're asking for more money. And in the meantime, your hard money is just killing you. We've all been in that situation. I got two little situations going on right now. Um, and, you know, what I found the key is, is what I do is I try to get them and I say, hey, guys, you know, all right, we'll work. I don't ever tell them I'm fired because you can't do that or they're going to leave. Um, B, then what I do is I find, I give them a list of things I want them to focus on that are the biggest pain for me to plug in subs. For example, when my generals do the windows, I can get those done for 350 bucks to $400 a window. If I bring in a straight sub and the guys have already started framing it, they charge me more to fix it. So I'm always trying to get them to at least knock off the pain in the butt items first and get them to get those in. And then even if, let's say, those pain items, i given them five, or i given them 20, they've done five. If Even if I can get half of those items done, then that's the breaking point I'll move on. Because at that point, it, it really comes down to what your hard money costs and how much your leverage costs is every, uh, every day. So if it's costing me $100 a day, I'll be a little bit more flexible with them. If it's costing me $300 a day, I'll fire them a lot quicker. Um, so we have a question as, as a lender, I must ask, uh, what about rehab loans? Would you, oops, sorry, excuse, uh, would you like to add a shared webinar for that? Uh, would I like to add a shared webinar for that? Oh, no, well, at Interest Funding, we do, uh, we do construction loans as well. Uh, but, and that's another good point. We're actually going to, um, the second or the third series that we're rolling out, uh, which will be in about 12 weeks, is all about leveraging cash. So for any investors that want to figure out how to get the highest cash on cash return, that will be the, and how to leverage your money the best, you're going to want to tune into that. And that will be presented by Will Heaton at Interest Funding. Um, how do you check for foundation skirting from Tiffany? Very good question. You know what I do? If it's a vacant house and it's at the auction, I'll go up and kick it. And if I kick it and it's not concrete, then I know right away. Or uh, what you want to do is just go up and just knock on it. If it's hollow, and you'll know right away because the foundation skirting will be a cement board and it's painted gray a lot of times, so it looks like concrete. Just go up and touch it. And if it, you know, if it's hollow, it's not a solid foundation. Or if it's, you know, solid concrete, then you're looking pretty good. Oh, Nate's got a good question. Me and Nate actually bought a house together, and it took a little bit longer than we thought. Uh, how much time do we, we allow for a contractor to finish a project? That really depends on the city and the permitting going on and what the, the scope of work is. But my typical timelines right now for like a split level house that is that doesn't have any electrical or plumbing going on and it's just a pull out, put back together, it's six to eight weeks. If it's a full, if it is rewiring, replumbing, doing a lot of drywall work in you know a 1950s or 60s house, it's taken us about 10 to 12 weeks. And if it's a 1920s home with permits involved i'm factoring five to six months um it really depends on what the city what's going on with the city and, and what they're doing at the size of the project um but at the end of the day guys almost all contractors finish late right now and so what you guys want to do is protect yourself with the contracts and then also not don't be so quick to just jump in and give a general the full project like what I do, and we'll talk about this in the next series, is I pull things out. 
like I'll pull the kitchen out because the kitchen's two phone calls for me to get it installed. And I'd rather just not give the money to the contractor. Um, so, but timing is, it can be tough. Usually I would say your typical projects are run you about eight to 10 weeks. Anything with bigger items, you're 10 to 12 weeks or I'd say 10 to 12. And then after that, you're probably about four to five months at Seattle if studs down. Um, uh, how many contractors should I get a bid from and how do I find a contractor? Those are all good things. Uh, so for me, I always get bids from two guys. Um, it really also depends because, you know, I'm also look, I always get two bids and then I kind of get a gauge on how much work they have going on because sometimes I'd rather hire even a more expensive guy that has less work so he can get it done faster than the cheapest guy who might be taking on multiple jobs everywhere. Um, so I always get two bids. How do I find a contractor? Honestly, I go out and word of mouth. I knock doors. I check on people. Uh, personal referrals is a big thing, guys. Like usually if someone refers them to me. I'm going to check them out. Um, and investor to investor works pretty well. That doesn't always work well. I mean, I've also gotten referrals from my own clients. They give me contractors and then they end up stealing my money. So it just, it, it kind of, kind of hit, hit or miss. But what I would do is for contractors, I mean, for well, one idea we, we had is we did a, we were given a TV giveaway at a local restaurant that had a lot of trade green going there quite a bit to help get business cards. But, um, you know, ways I would do it is go network with other investors, get, get them, uh, verified through them and then have them come look at some sites and then go look at some of their sites. Um, the other thing you can do is if you're looking for a contractor, just drive around the city of Seattle. If you see a flip house going on, go go talk to the contractor working on it. My my guess is they'll, they'll want more work. Nate asks, uh, do we have a do we penalize contractors if they time to finish? So what we have is in a construction contract is we do write it. I write it at anywhere between depending on the size of the project at $150 to $300 per day if they're late. Okay. And then in my construction contract, it does detail out like how they're supposed to handle delays. So if the city doesn't give them a permit for three weeks, they're supposed to give me a, a written email documenting the dates to adjust the timeline. Now, none of those guys do that. So I keep track of all that. And then really what I do a lot of times, because, you know, right now contractors are running late also because their subcontractors are running late. And so I try to give be reasonable with them because you, you guys, if you do find a good contractor, you kind of want to work with them that you can trust, but you got to keep it. You got to be firm with them. So I, what I'll do is I'll say, Hey, look, contractor, you're 30 days late. I know 12 of those are, um, you're from your subs. So you're really 18 days where you kind of neglected my project, which cost me money. So then what I do is I'll take the, the I kind of figure that out and I'll go over and I negotiate any kind of change order with them if I can. So instead of paying or deducting their money, I just negotiate better terms on my change orders if they come up because a lot of times it's going to save me more money than the actual penalty fees. But um, what I would say is per day, 150 bucks to $300 a day, depending on the size of the, the, the loan. Um, we have a question that says, uh, we, with unpermitted conversions, carports, bedrooms, utility rooms, um, when you stumble across major wood rod, do you scrap getting these addition spaces permitted or do you go over budget and add to the overall functionality? Uh, so on unpermitted carports, bedrooms, and utility rooms, so a lot of times if they're you know, I guess the, the first question on that I would ask was, well, well, what's the size of the house that you're working with versus the per unpermitted size? Because let's say you have a house that's 750 square feet and your unpermitted is 200 and it gets you to that 950 range. 200 square feet can make a big deal at a house that's below 1,000 square feet. Because, I mean, people think it's only 200 square feet, but really that's 20% of the structure. And so depending on if I really need that, 20% or 200 square feet, that's where I'll just, you know, based on what my comparables are telling me. So, you know, if my comparables are at 750 or selling for 350, but then there's the ones at 900 or selling for 410, I'm probably going to fix the addition. Now, if it's, if they're selling at 
you know, a, like a less than variance of a $25,000 variance, then a lot of times I'm just going to rip off the permit, the unpermitted addition because the extra funds doesn't make sense for me. Um, and then kind of going into the, the size of scale of work, you know, I will fix anything if it has a foundation. Now, if I have an unpermitted addition that's sitting on wood that has no structural sound, it's not structurally sound, it's rotted, it's not worth doing. It's not worth fixing. You're, you're basically adding on to the house at that point. It, honestly, you're, it costs you more than adding on because you got to demo it too. So at that point, I would demo and move it on. But if it has good footing, good structure, I try to work with it whenever I can because usually it's going to cost me around, you know, 50 to $75 a square foot to repair that section in Typically, I'm selling those homes for anywhere between three and five hundred dollars a square foot, or maybe more in the neighborhood. So the value always comes back. Um, any parcel location cities you stay away from because of contractor or permit issues? Very good question. City of Des Moines, I can't stand that inspector. I won't deal with them at all. A lot of people get along with them. I personally won't buy in Des Moines. Uh, Mount Lake Terrace, the one of the worst in inspection. Uh, head building officials I've ever met. They were great two years ago, and then a guy moved down from Bellingham. Me and him have had many sit-down conversations. Um, he writes his own code, so I don't like that um, because I go off building code, and he's going off his code. Um, so I stay away from those two cities, especially. Um, the other things I kind of pay attention to is, you know, just certain things. You know, each city, and again, uh, you guys, this is it's really good to work with a broker team that knows every city really well. Like we know city of Des Moines has certain hot buttons. Mount Lake Terrace has certain hot buttons. We know in city of Tacoma, they're, they're only going to allow certain square footage to be um, actually marketed and, and, and finished. So we pick projects based on what we know on those and we make the adjustments before we look at them. So um, I would just, watch you know work with a good broker team and then kind of walk you through that oh the other one that's on my hot list right now is city kirkland they're absolutely terrible um they they probably cost us 30 grand and stuff that was very very unreasonable uh, it's that addition i was telling about earlier they just they make up their own code so uh do i recommend to hire interior designer uh if you've never flipped a house before, you guys, it's not a bad idea. Uh, or good thing is, at Heat and Daynard, if you hire us as a listing broker, the interior design's free. So you don't have to hire anybody. You can save it and you just pay the standard real estate commission. Our brokers have designed over 1,500 flip houses for people that have all been sold. Are you deducting upfront on your offers? Okay. Are you deducting upfront on your offers to market ad adjustments? Oh, um, um, that question. Um, are you deducting upfront on your offers for market adjustments? Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, actually, Nate, who's a real estate broker, asked a very good question. Um, are we making adjustments right now for market basically conditions? Yes. For us, and for me as an investor, what I have to do is always make adjustments on my current systems, right? Because my system's different than everybody else's, and your system should be different than mine. So what I do is I look at these, you know, anyone brings me a deal, I look at this through my, you know, they have the way that they're looking at it. And I might like that deal, even if I'm not going to do their same plan, because I have my own plan and my own system. And, you know, so I always have to make my adjustments. It's, you know, every investor should make their adjustments on what they're good at, what they're talented at, and what their skill set is. Um, but right now, if you're talking about the market conditions and it, you know, kind of being a little bit slow out there, then yeah. So what we do is, you know, right now we're adjusting to, to instead of having flips on average of five to six months, we're, we're planning on holding them for nine, uh, just because you want to pack that into your performance to make sure you're covering all your cost bases. Um, I'm in the Southwest Washington. Uh, I mean, Southwest Washington, very competitive market. Uh, what is a minimum return opportunity you'll uh, pursue? Uh, you'll pursue to be worth it. Um, but it's not really a construction question, but what I can tell you is I don't look at any deal unless it's a minimum 15% cash on cash return with no leverage factored in. If it's leveraged deal, if I'm looking at it, I'm targeting 30 to 40%. 
can't read that. So the question is, how do you deal with a contractor that doesn't come back and fix his bad work? Um, that is another big problem that we all have. Yeah. So the best thing you could do is you do a thorough punch list on the contractor and then hold back $1,500 until all those items are done. Um, if you're worried about the mechanical work of the contractor, which, you know, some of the guys do do rougher work, you know, what I would do is hire, a, do a pre, if it's a big concern to you, yours, and you don't think this guy will come back no matter what to fix his items, before you give him that hold back amount of, you know, let's say you hold back $1,500 or $5,000 from his bid, have the home pre-inspected, not, uh, so that way it knocks out most of the items of the items that your buyer will find on the next inspection anyways. Um, and you guys, as a broker, what we're telling people is, honestly, with your flip houses, there's so much in, like flip homes coming to market right now. What you want to do is you want to make sure your homes are pre-inspected because when we get a buyer on the line, you want to make sure that, that that deal doesn't flip. So it's a good way to, A, make your property more marketable and then also cover your basis to where the contractor won't come back and not do his job. But yeah, that's very, it's a very big problem, guys. You know, they, they're like, oh, I got paid, and they're out, right? They move on to the next project, and then trying to get them back is hard. So the best thing to do is hold back some money on them. Yeah, so you guys, we're, we're about 7 o'clock now. Um, I, I'm going to stay around for another, you know, five minutes or so, uh, five to ten minutes to answer people's questions. Uh, but... Uh, right now, what we'll do is we'll kind of wrap it up. If you have more questions, feel free to just kind of keep firing them in. Um, the next webinar is going to be in two weeks, and that's where I am going to go over negotiating your contractor, a way age, establishing your budget. So after we walked it, we documented everything, how I put my budget together, and then how I negotiate these guys. And in, in, uh, you guys will all get to learn my secret jam in method, which is my favorite thing to save budget on. So uh, this, uh, if Again, uh, this copy of this presentation also will be on our website at www.geekydaner.com. Uh, you can download it anytime or send it off to your friends um, or other investors you may know. Um, and also, uh, if you're not clients of ours, which it looks like there's a few of you guys that are not, um, you can come check us out. We have a free uh, cash flow and flip class. It's every two weeks at our class uh, or at our office in Bellevue. It's free. And what we do is we teach you guys on how we do these things and how we find the deals. Um, so uh, feel free to come to that class and hopefully you guys all stick around for the webinar and we'll get through this whole four part series and you guys learn some things. And Lee, yes, you can email me a bunch of questions on your project. That's totally fine. Yeah, any of our clients feel free to call me, email me, blow me up and I will meet you at site if I need to as well. Sue, thank you for coming to class twice and we thank you for bringing friends. It's always a nice thing. All right. Well, we're going to actually wrap this up right now, and everyone have a good night. Again, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to your brokers. If you're um, uh, an employee or a client of ours, uh, reach out to our brokers, ask them questions, or, or hit me up. We're here to help and help you get your properties done.